Your generous support makes this ministry possible. Thank you. Father, thank you again for the hope that we have in Christ. We do uh, have a bright future, and it is based upon the fact that the one who died for us is also living. We have a risen, living, living Savior, and because he lives, we will live also. We look forward to uh, that day in which we will be changed and we will be like him, and we do thank you for now, for this time that we have your word before us. Do teach us and bless us through the study of it today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We began last time, and you notice Paul begins the chapter by saying, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which you also received, in which you also stands. So he mentions here as a new subject, he, uh, he has made known the gospel to them. And then he's going to outline the gospel and he's going to talk about in the first 11 verses the, the one of the essentials of the facts of the gospel is the resurrection of Christ. But if you look at verses 1 to 11, there's no indication here as to why he is bringing up this subject. Why is he talking about the gospel? Why is he talking about the resurrection of Christ? It isn't really until verse 12 that we come to uh, see what the, what the real problem was in the church at Corinth. He says, now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? And so, we were saying that uh, there were some there at Corinth who were denying not the resurrection of Christ, but the resurrection of believers. This just did not fit with Greek thought in that day, which looked at the body as evil, as the material as sinful, the material word is, world is sinful. And so this body is a, a prison. This is why Paul is bringing up the subject. And in verse 3, he begins to, to talk about the gospel. For I delivered to you as of first importance. So what he is saying here, these are the essential facts of the gospel. What are they? Uh, he says, I delivered to you what I also received. Now, Paul doesn't tell us here how he had received the gospel. In fact, he uses a word that indicates uh, uh, being, being taught things from other, from other people. What he says in Galatians 1 and 2 is that First of all, the foundation, the essence of the gospel, he received directly from Christ. He did not get it from the other apostles. He was not taught it. However, there were, there were facts of the life of Christ, even facts here of the resurrection, the details of the resurrection of appearances that he had gotten from from. Uh, the early Christians, the other apostles. So, his, his gospel, the main essence of it, he got directly from Christ. Some of the details he may have picked up from, from the other early, early Christians. But he says, uh, uh, what I received, I have, I have passed on to you. And so then he outlines the essential facts of the gospel. Now, what are the four essentials that he mentions here? First of all is what? 
What's the first? Christ died for our sin. What's second? He was buried. Thirdly, he was raised. Fourth, he was seen, his resurrection appearances. So you have his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his resurrection appearances. These are, these are essential facts that, uh, are related, that, that are part of the gospel. But you notice when he talks about the death of Christ, he doesn't just say Christ died. You know, he says Christ was buried, he was raised, but he doesn't just say Christ died. Um, he, says, he says more. It's not just the bare fact of Christ's death, which is the, which is the gospel. Uh, the, go the death of Christ is essential to the gospel, but it's not just uh, the passion of the Christ, the movie that goes into all of the details of the physical death of Christ. It's amazing when you look at the gospels how, how unvivid, is that a word? <laughs> how they present the death of Christ, the crucifixion, without building up the, uh, the details of the physical suffering of, of the death of Christ. Because it was much more than just the physical suffering. He died, what does he say, for our sins. He died for our, our sins. Uh, that's why his death was different than anybody else's death. Nobody else has ever died for our sins. Nobody else could die for our sins. When it says he died for our sins, the word for uh, in Greek has two meanings. It can mean for the benefit of, and it also can mean in the place of. Christ's death was a substitutionary death. When he died, was it for our benefit? Absolutely. But why was the death of Christ for our benefit? You see, you cannot explain how his death was for our benefit unless he died in our place. It's the fact that he was our substitute, paying the penalty for our sins, bearing our guilt, uh, that is the reason why his death is for our benefit. Those who deny, those who deny the, uh, the, 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 the penal substitutionary death of Christ really have a, tr ha have, have a difficult time explaining how Christ's death was in any way for our, for our benefit. So he died for our sins but then it also says about his death, he died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now what's the significance of the death of Christ? When he says it was according to the scriptures, the scriptures not only predicted the death of Christ, the scriptures also explain the death of Christ. The Old Testament explains the death of of Christ for us. Just one passage, which is, uh, which is very vivid, is Isaiah 53 and verses 5 and 6. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell on him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. The scriptures tell us what the significance of his death was. So he mentions, what's the first fact of the gospel? 
It's the death of Christ. The death of Christ for our sins. The death of Christ for our sins as the scripture has, has told us about it. Second fact of the gospel, what is it? He was buried. And he doesn't say much about the, uh, that, but the burial emphasizes both the fact and the finality of his death. Why was he buried? Because he had died. Uh, so uh, the burial is important. It's important in this context. A lot of other passages don't mention the burial of Christ that much. But in this context, our subject is what? Resurrection. The resurrection. And the, the, the fact of his burial is important for the reality of his resurrection. Third thing, he was raised. He was raised. He was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Now, there are two things that are interesting about this verb, he was raised. First of all, it's passive. When it says he was raised, and you have a passive verb, you ask the question, by whom? By whom? Who did it? Who raised him from the dead? And scripture indicates that it was, it was God who raised him from the dead. What was the resurrection? He died for our sins. God raised him from the dead. He was raised. The resurrection was God's seal of approval. It was God's witness, his seal of approval, that the work that he did there on the cross was fully completed. It fully satisfied a holy God in relationship to our, to our sins. What he did on the, work, on the cross, when he died for our sins, when he paid the penalty for our sins, what did Jesus say? It is finished. And you know what God said? Amen and he raised him from the dead. That was God's witness that, uh, that, he was, that, that he really did accomplish that work of dying for our sins. And so God raised him from the dead according to the scriptures. So the first thing to notice about that verb, he, he was raised, um, it's passive, indicating that God raised him. The second thing, is, uh, is that in the Greek, this verb is a perfect tense. And the, the perfect tense in Greek looks at a past action that has present results. What was the past action? No, he was raised. That's the verb, not the death. He was raised. What's the past action? Simple answer. God raised him. God raised him from the dead, right? That took place on the first Easter Sunday. But the verb is the present results, indicates the present results of that past action. What are the present results? He is alive. He is a risen Savior. He is, a, he is risen and alive. We have a risen Savior. And when we say he's alive, we punctuate it with hallelujah. <laughs> so that's, that's the third thing that he mentions. And then the fourth thing uh, that he mentions that makes up this, uh, the gospel, is, uh, involves the resurrection appearances. And Paul goes into uh, quite a bit of detail on this. In fact, this goes from verses 5 to 11. 
And he is, he is presenting here the essential facts that relate to the resurrection. Now, the Corinthians did not deny the resurrection of Christ. They did not deny uh, these essential facts. But Paul is, uh, is, is emphasizing here the resurrection of Christ and the fact of his resurrection because that involves, or our, in, our resurrection is really bound up with it. Now, when Paul talks about the resurrection of Christ, uh, the evidence, the evidence for the resurrection of Christ is based upon, upon two lines of evidence. Uh, one is the empty tomb. The second involves the resurrection appearances. Uh, that's, why, that's why Paul mentions he was buried, because you have the evidence of the empty tomb. And then he goes into detail about the resurrection appearances. One of the, one of the things that uh, the most hardened skeptics today have to admit is the fact that the early church believed in the, uh, the literal bodily resurrection of Christ. In fact, they have to admit that the close disciples of Christ, those who were with him in his earthly ministry, they really believed that he rose from the dead. In fact, they not only believed in it, that that was a, that was a, a, a truth, a fact that they were willing to die for. Uh, some people are willing to die for a falsehood. But it's hard to find anybody who will die for a falsehood that he knows is a falsehood. It's hard to get anybody to die for what he knows to be a lie. The fact is that the early Christians did believe in the resurrection of Christ and they were willing to, to die for it. Now, we say that the, the, uh, the early church believed this. Now, how do you account for that belief? They saw him crucified. They knew that he, that he died. And yet, they came, to be, they, they came to be convinced that he actually had risen from the dead and was alive. And uh, there are two things that you do have to explain. I mean, you can be uh, like the ostrich and hide your head in the sand. Uh, you don't have to explain anything. But if you really want to, to, uh, to be uh, responsible and, uh, and look at the facts, you do have to explain the... Uh, the, the belief of the early Christians based upon two things, the, the empty tomb and the resurrection appearances. Now, skeptics have come up with many theories. Uh, there, are, there is the swoon theory that Jesus never died. There is the, uh, the theory that the disciples came and stole the body. In fact, you even have that theory there in the, uh, uh, presented in Matthew chapter 28. That was invented by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. You have uh, the theory that the, uh, that, the, uh, that, that the disciples just all hallucinated and thought that they saw the risen Christ. All of these different theories that people have come up with. Even the skeptics themselves go through them and say that explanation is not very, very plausible. There are many good books that examine all of, uh, all of these different viewpoints. Josh McDowell has had a couple of, uh, of books, uh, Evidence That Demands 
a verdict. He has a new one. Uh, the, uh, uh, the modern one is, the, is two of his books, more evidence that demands a ber verdict. Uh, he has a book with his son, Evidence for the, for the Resurrection. He'll go through those different theories and, and evaluate them. But the uh, one thing that must be explained is the empty tomb. Uh, nobody ever, ever produced the body. And you had all of those Jewish leaders in Jerusalem that wanted to produce the body. That would have settled the case. All they had to do was, was find the body. Now, the empty tomb by itself is, is not sufficient. Much more important is the fact of the, the resurrection appearances. And you notice the detail that Paul goes into here about the resurrection appearances. It says in verse 5 that he appeared to Cephas. Cephas is the Se Semitic name of Peter. Uh, and he mentions Peter, Cephas here first. Maybe two reasons. First of all, Peter was the leader and spokesman of the apostles. Uh, I think more significantly, it was probably that Christ appeared to Peter by himself, singled out Peter because Peter had denied him. And Peter was thoroughly ashamed and Christ came to him and uh, gave him the encouragement that he needed to go on to be the great uh, apostle and preacher in the New Testament. So he, he appeared to Cephas. Then he appeared to the twelve. Who were the twelve? The disciples, the apostles. How many were there? There were only eleven at the time of the, uh, of the appearances because Judas. You notice how the word, how, how the, the term the twelve uh, had just become a fixed number. It was, it was referring to the apostles as a group uh, because in the earthly ministry of Christ there had been 12. Later on in the book of Acts there were 12. It had just become a fixed name. Uh, Judas was not among them. Then notice the next thing that is said, and this is the only place in the Bible that we have this in verse 6. After that, he appeared to 500 brethren at one time. 500. That couldn't be a, a hallucination. You can't get 500 people having the same hallucination at one time. That was not just a, a vision. You can't get 500 having the same vision at the same time. This was uh, a massive group that Christ appeared to. And you notice what Paul says, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. So what he is saying here is that the majority of these 500 are still alive. And if you, if you tend to be skeptical you actually can, can go and question them and get their personal testimony in relationship to what had happened to them. So you have the 500. And then it also says uh, that he appeared to James. Who was James? He was the Lord's brother. This is not James the apostle. James would have fit in that that other group. This is, this is James, the Lord's brother. And then it says, uh, last of all, as it were to one untimely a born, he appeared to me also. Sometimes it is said uh, that yes, you have these witnesses in the New Testament uh, 
but they're all Christians. The only ones who testify that they saw the risen Christ were Christians. Well, the 500 were brethren, but when Paul, when Christ appeared to James, and when Christ appeared to Paul, they weren't believers. James and the other brothers of the Lord were not his disciples during the earthly ministry of Christ. Yes, yeah, they, they were not uh, believers. Yes, they became believers when Christ appeared to them, both Paul and James, uh, but they were previously unbelievers. Paul was the persecutor of the church. Now, what does Paul say about Christ's appearance to him? He says in verse 8, he, he, he appeared to me last of all. Last of all. You see what that indicates? The final resurrection appearance of Christ was to the Apostle Paul. That's why there are no more apostles today. You remember in 9, chapter 9 and verse 1, Paul says, Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus the Lord? One of the requirements for being an apostle was to be an eyewitness of the resurrection, resurrected Christ. Paul was the last. And you do not have Christ appearing to any others physically like this since then. And that is why there are no apostles today. So he mentions that last of all, and then he uses in verse 8 an interesting, interesting word, an interesting statement. Last of all, as it were to one untimely born, he appeared to me. Now what Paul is referring to here is the abnormal nature of his apostleship. Uh, the word that he uses is uh, actually the word for a miscarriage or an abortion. Uh, it is referred to a, 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 a birth where you do not have the normal nine months growth and development, gestation in the womb. Uh, and what he is saying, look at the other apostles. Look at the other apostles. They were with Christ for three and a half years. Uh, they, they responded to the call of Christ. And they followed him. That was not Paul's experience. That was not Paul's experience. In fact, he rejected Christ. He was a persecutor of the church. Uh, he, he only came to faith when Christ clobbered him, confronted him on the road to Damascus and, uh, and spoke to him in this, in this kind of way. So, uh, what he is saying here is that uh, the others represented the norm, his apostleship, because of the way he came to Christ, was really abnormal. Now, some people have tried to uh, explain the abnormality in a, in a couple of ways. Uh, some have said that this word miscarriage or uh, untimely birth was a taunt of his enemies, that he was not a real apostle, that he was some kind of freak because he had not been with Christ. Um, others have said that his untimely birth was that he came to faith in Christ before the nation of Israel, the rest of his fellow countrymen, will come to Christ as you have in, in Romans 11, uh, 20, 26, 
Paul says that uh, in a future day, all Israel would be, will be saved. Uh, I don't think either of those two, that it was a taunt or that it is referring to the fact that he came to Christ before the rest of the nation. The fact is the other apostles also came to Christ before the nation of Israel will be restored in, Act, in, in Romans 8, 8, 26 at that, at that future day. Verse 9, the next verse, really tells you why he looked upon himself as abnormal. What does he say in verse 9? For I am the least of the apostles and am not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. His apostleship was different. It was different. Now, when he says, I am the least of the apostles, he is saying that word least, not in the sense of inferior. But he is saying, look, those were the ones who were with Christ through his whole earthly ministry. What was I? I was a persecutor of the church. And because of that, I am not worthy I am not worthy. I am not fit to be an apostle. Those that Christ had chosen and who accompanied him and who listened to his teaching for those three and a half years, he says, that's what, that's what an apostle should be. But I don't fit into that category. I was a persecutor of the church. That's why he says that my birth as a believer and as an apostle, was really uh, an untimely birth. You notice verse 10? But. But. But what? By the grace of God, I am what I am. But. The grace of God. That's a great, that's a great statement. But the grace of God. We could all look at our own lives and we probably could say, you know where I would be? You know where I would be today? And uh, a lot of the places that we would picture ourselves might not be pleasant, but the grace of God. That's what happened in Paul's life. He was a persecutor of the church. He was killing Christians, but the grace of God. The grace of God transformed him. The grace of God saved him. The grace of God made him an apostle. And the grace of God made his ministry effective. His grace toward me did not prove to be vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Now here, when Paul talks about his labor, he's talking about his preaching of the gospel throughout the world. And he's not talking about the fact that uh, his gospel was more effective than the other apostles. Uh, that, may, that, that, that may be true. That may be true. But he says, I labored more. Uh, Paul labored. It was the grace of God that caused that ministry to be effective. Back in chapter 3, you remember, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. And so he says that his labors, when you look at uh, the, the New Testament and the number of books that we have from the Apostle Paul in the, in the New Testament, what we see is the, the, the great work that God had done in him and the grace of God took this persecutor of the church and made him, made him the great apostle. And so, therefore, verse 11, whether therefore, whether then, that word then or therefore, 
back to the point. Back to the point. Uh, he had been talking about the resurrection appearances of Christ. So he is emphasizing here the resurrection of Christ. So then, whether then it was I or they, so we preached. We preach. And so you believed. What he is saying is, the message that I preach to you is the same message that all of the apostles have been preaching. What is it the message of? The Savior who died for our sins, who was buried, who was raised, and who appeared to, uh, to his disciples. That's the same message that Paul had been preaching, the other apostles had been preaching, and that was really the message that the Corinthians heard and they had believed. It is the message of the risen Christ. So, verses 1 to 11 are not, he's not trying to prove the resurrection of Christ, but he is trying to emphasize that the resurrection of Christ was one of the essential facts of the gospel. That's going to be the basis of his argument in the following verses to show that believers are going to be resurrected. Um, verses 12 to 19 give us the consequences of uh, denying the resurrection. Uh, you have the fact of Christ's resurrection. Now, if you want to deny the resurrection, period, look at where it's going to get you. And so that's what we have here in verses 12 to 19. He uses that word if six times in verses 12 to 19. And what he's going to say, if there is no resurrection, then what follows? If there's no resurrection, what does that imply? What does that require? And so, uh, what he, he is going to say here, bottom line in verses 12 to 19, is that uh, the Christian faith if you, is useless. The Christian faith is useless, worthless, if Men do not rise from the dead. The Christian faith is useless if men do not rise from the dead. And there are several arguments that, uh, that make this up. First point, uh, verses 12 to 14, Paul says that the Christian faith lacks reality. because Christ could not have been raised if there's no resurrection of the dead. The Christian faith lacks reality. So here we begin to see in verse 12 why all of this emphasis on the resurrection of Christ. Uh, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection? resurrection of the dead. 